Okay, so last class we studied about the presence of God, right? And um, we looked at how people were hungry for the presence of God because in the presence of God, amazing things happening for the believer. And we have been designed, created to live in the presence of God, right? to have fellowship with God and to experience His presence, right? So we, we studied all that. Uh, and worship is about experiencing His presence, being drawing near and to experience the presence of God, even as He draws near. We also looked at uh, varying degrees of the presence of God, right? We looked at how God is omnipresent, He's everywhere, but we also know that He has promised His presence where two or three are gathered. And we also read about the, the manifest presence of God, right? So, so the presence of God is worth, worth defending uh, in the sense in our own lives, to be aware of the presence of God, to be hungry for the presence of God, um, for more of His presence is something that we need to long for and desire, right? And so when we say, okay, we need to defend or, you know, we need to really fight for it in the sense there is a lot of things that come against, you know, taking away or stealing, uh, you know, that desire for God, that appetite for God, right? So we need to be aware, first of all, and we need to have value, you know, only when we value do will we actually say, okay, I want to give my all. I want to, you know, put in my best effort in order to defend this, right? So, uh, so we need to be aware of that, right? So today we look at uh, chapter eight, which is uh, personal worship and corporate worship. Okay, um, just one second. Let me just project this. Okay, so personal worship and corporate worship. So, so what is the main difference? Personal worship is something that you do on your own, right? And corporate worship is worship when we collectively gather together and worship the Lord. Many times our impression or picture of worship is uh, one of the other. Right? I remember having a conversation with a person and he said, uh, you know, I'll, I'll anyway worship on my own. So I will come during the message time, right? I'll anyway worship, uh, and God is uh, you know present everywhere. So I worship on my own, and when I come to church, I'll come during the message. I don't want to be part of the worship. Okay, so that was his, uh, that was his uh, you know thought, and uh, and some people say some people think that okay, worship is only when we gather together, as a as a group as a church. Only when we gather together, you know, only then it makes sense to worship, right? So. Both are, both extremes are wrong because God does something unique when we gather together as a body, right? When we gather together as a body and when we worship, God does something unique. God releases something, right? His presence, His power among us, and there's a purpose and uh, something that is accomplished when we worship together collectively. Right? Which cannot be, you know, which cannot be accomplished when we worship Him on our own. Right? And God does something when we worship Him on our own, which cannot be accomplished when we, you know, gather together and worship. Right? In the sense, there's something deep, something personal that He does in our lives when we personally, you know, of our own approach Him, and you know, we make our choice to worship the Lord, right, personally. So both are important and both are instituted in scripture, right? Both are scriptural. Okay. So we need to understand that it's not one without the other, right? It's, it's both personal as well as corporate worship. Okay. So let's look at, uh, when we look at uh, the whole aspect of worship itself, we studied that, you know, we gather together or we draw near to God in order to offer our worship in order to offer our sacrifice of worship to Him, right? And what is that sacrifice? Anyone? What is that sacrifice that we offer? Yeah, Hebrews 13 talks about the fact that it is the praise, which is the fruit of our lips, which means when we, out of our heart, fullness of our heart, when we you know, speak out or sing out and declare, you know, God sees that as an offering. Right? as a sacrifice, just like how the Old Testament, you know, the priest did. God sees that. Right? So we take it seriously and we do that. 
right? So when we offer our sacrifice to God, God receives it. And when he receives it, we experience his presence, we experience his power and so on, right? So, so let's look at this tabernacle, okay? The tabernacle that God instituted or God designed and asked Moses uh, to build it. And, um, and, and we see that when we study the tabernacle, um, I'm sorry, I don't have a, any picture right now. But when we study the tabernacle, we see that there is a journey. You know, we see several compartments in the tabernacle, right? Which God specifically put together for a purpose and instituted for a purpose. It has significance. It has meaning. And so when people actually journeyed, and some were not allowed in certain sections, but when people journeyed, they actually offered their sacrifice to God, they experienced God, and something happened to them as well, right? So does anyone know what are the parts of the tabernacle, right? Okay, so we see the outer court. What, hap what, what is there in the outer court? Sorry? Yeah, so the people can gather in the outer court, but what do we see in the outer court? There are some specific things that are placed there in the outer court. Okay, so let's look at that. Okay, um, if you can follow in the notes, right? The tabernacle. There are three sections. First, you know, like we saw, the outer court, then the inner court, and what is called the holy of holies or the most holy place. You no, know, three basic sections. Right? So in the outer court, the outer court had an altar. Okay, what is an altar? I'm sorry, a place to offer something to God. Okay, so it's it's most likely a raised place, place, right? Put up of stones or whatever material. It's a raised place, a raised place. Sorry, and it's um, it's it's typical to offer something to God in that place. And so that's an altar. So we see there is an altar there in the outer court. There is something else also. What is it? We see that there is a bronze laver, which is full of water, which means big vessel. right? It's a big vessel, which is full of water. Now, the priest will come. The priest will have a ritualistic ceremonial washing of hands and feet. Um, there, right there, you know, symbolic of consecration, symbolic of washing away of sin, and so on. And on the altar, various kinds of sacrifices or offerings were placed. Okay, some of them would be, you know, burnt offerings, which were typical for atonement of sin. There were grain offerings, right, as for memorial to God. Peace offering for thanksgiving, sin offering, trespass offering, and all these kinds of offerings were placed on the altar. Right? So the two things we see, one is the, the laver, which has water, there's a vessel for ceremonial washing for the priest, and the altar. Right? And uh, so the blood of the offering, you know, it's, it's when you read about it, you see that in, in uh, Exodus, when you read, you see that it's, uh, it's quite a messy place. Right, there's a lot of blood. There's a lot of uh, you know all these things are happening, and it's it's not a very pretty place like we see in the pictures. It's quite a messy thing that is happening there. But there, there's blood is shed, and we know that whatever is happening there is actually symbolic. God instituted it, so it is symbolic of what would happen, what would follow, right? And the book of Hebrews brings it out very beautifully. What happened there? In the tabernacle and the connection between what Jesus did is there in the book of Hebrews. Okay, so we look at that as well. Okay, so outer outer courts, this is what is there. You know, that's what we need to remember. There is this vessel where is the ceremonial washing, and there is this altar where is the offering. Uh, it could be animal offering, it could be grain offering um, for various purposes, and it is offered there. Right. Then we move on. So we move on to what is called the inner court. And in the inner court, we have three things which is mentioned there. Right? One is there is a table, and on that table there is bread. Okay? And the Bible calls it showbread, and um, it is symbolic of 
God meeting our natural needs, our physical needs, and also God meeting our spiritual needs. Right? So there is bread that is kept there. So we have a table, and it's called the table of show bread. And uh, the so bread which is freshly baked, which is kept there. Okay? Then opposite that is the lampstand. And it is it's a lampstand with seven wicks, right? And there's olive oil which is which is put there. And uh, in in the uh, inner court, the illumination or the light inside that room, inside that section, is only from the lamp. Okay, so that is something that is also of significance. So the lamp gives light, and the lamp is filled with uh, oil. It's it's um, it's what you call as the menorah, right? Seven. It's got seven stems, and um, and from that light, you are able to see the table. You see, it eliminates the whole room. And from that light from the lamp is what we see. We, can, we are able to see the showbread. Right? Now, this lamp, symbolic of the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. Right? Illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. Right? And the bread, referring to the bread of life, the Lord Jesus, you know, he introduced himself. He said, you know, I am the bread of life. Right? So it has its significance in what Jesus did, in who Jesus, who Jesus is, all that in the tabernacle. Now, during those days, probably they didn't have an understanding. Right? They would not have under, had an understanding. The priest would not have an understanding. Okay, this is what it signifies. But then we see that revelation of that symbolic significance in Jesus. Right? And Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, he just makes that connection. He says, this is what it was, right? Okay, so there was a lampstand with the oil. There is a table with showbread. And there is also an, there's also an altar, another altar in which incense is burnt. Okay, so fragrant incense is burnt. And this incense represents, you know, it's a something fragrant. It goes before God. When we look at the book of Revelation, we see that the incense going before the throne of God is symbolic of the prayers and the intercession of the saints. Okay? So, the second section, the inner court, we see the table of showbread, we see the altar of incense, and we also see the lamp which is there, right? Three things which are there. Now, in, from, the, from that section to the most holy place, or what is called as the Holy of Holies, it is separated by a curtain. Okay? Now, this Holy of Holies, it, it was approached or it was accessed by the high priest alone. Okay? Only the high priest could go there, and he could go there only once a year. Right? He would go there once a year, and that had the Ark of the Covenant, okay? the Ark which the Israelites carried. The Ark of the Covenant was kept there. On top of it was the what is called as the mercy seat. Okay, so, so here there was nothing that the priest had to do. Okay. Outer court, the priest had to do something. He had to wash, he had to offer that sacrifice, grain, animal, whatever that was offered. Inside there was the showbread. He had to fill the lamp. The in fact, the, the previous day's showbread, the, the priests were all actually authorized to eat it, they would partake of it, right, symbolizing you know, sustenance and, uh, and that he is the bread of life and, and God sustaining us physically, spiritually, etc. The whole place illuminated by the lamp, ref referring to the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit, the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Right? And the altar of incense, so he would go and burn fresh incense on that altar so that it would go up before God as a fragrant offering. Okay? So all this the priest would do. But when he goes to the holy, most holy place, the Holy of Holies, there's nothing for him to do. Right? Because that is where God would speak, that God would meet, that God would actually make his presence felt in that most holy place. Right? So, so you see, we see it's a journey from the outer court to the inner court to the most holy place. And we can see that that is a journey and that is symbolic of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus for us on the cross. 
right? Let's look at uh, Hebrews chapter 9. You can just follow in the notes, right? Hebrews 9 and verse 9, it says, it was symbolic, referring to the tabernacle and the sacrifice. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Okay, So the priest would offer over and over again on behalf of the people. He would go there over and over again, right? Because it was not enough to make one person perfect, but it was enough for God to cover or atone for a, for a season, the sin, right? So it was symbolic for the present time. Verse 11 and 12. But Christ came as the high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but his own precious, sorry, with, with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Let's read that again, right? Verse 11, but Christ came as high priest, right? So the, there is this earthly high priest who is going into the tabernacle, but Christ came as the high priest, of good things to come with the greater and perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation not with blood of goats and calves but with his own blood he entered the most holy place so he's talking about a heavenly tabernacle which the bible talks about but christ came as a fulfillment as the perfect high priest to offer up these sacrifices right once and for all having obtained what Eternal redemption. Okay, having obtained eternal redemption. Okay, so, so this was a parallel. The Old Testament, what we see, the priests coming there, offering up the sacrifice and uh, the atonement for sin. It was a parallel to what Jesus would do, right? Thousands of thousands of years later, what the Lord Jesus would do, and it was symbolic of that. Okay. So we see that the Lord Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. So that was that was what was symbolized, right? Hebrews 10 and uh, verse 11 and 12 has uh, has this to say, right? It says that every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, referring to Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down. At the right hand of God. Okay, so we are. While we study this tabernacle, we need to make that connection that the Lord Jesus is that perfect sacrifice. The Lord Jesus was that high priest as well, right? Who who redeemed us once and for all. It says one sacrifice for sins forever, right? Eternal redemption. Okay. The second thing that we need to understand when we study the tabernacle is that. Um, we need to understand that we are the royal priesthood. Okay, our identity, just like how the priests went and offered, we are the royal priesthood. How do we know that? Right? Uh, we see that um, the Bible talks that uh, talks about us as the royal priesthood. First Peter, you know, we can look at that verse. Let's go to um, First Peter. First Peter 2, verse 9, right? It says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Okay, you are a chosen generation, referring to you know, the disciples, the followers of the Lord. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special, special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Okay, so... So that is something that we are called. We are called, you are the royal priesthood. What does royal mean? Something to do with kings, queens, people who are ruling, right? Kingdom, crown, throne, right? So all that referring to royalty. So we are seated with him, with the king in the high places. We are seated with him. We are, uh, and we are seated with him to rule and reign. 
So we are royal royalty in that sense, and but we also are the royal priesthood. We are the priests of God to minister to God in this manner. Right? So we are the royal priesthood. Okay. Now let's look at uh, Hebrews 10 and verse 19. Okay, it says. Um, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Okay, so we are the royal priesthood. We have been given access to come, draw near, to offer up our sacrifice of praise to God. Right? And it's unlimited access, unlike in those days where the high priest could go only once a year into the Holy of Holies. But we have been given unlimited access. So this is what it says, you know, having boldness to enter the holiest. Right? Having boldness, each one of us, having boldness to enter the holiest, meaning you enter the very presence of God. What gives us the boldness? It's the blood of Jesus. What gives us the boldness? Because we are redeemed by his blood. Because our sins are overlooked, are washed away, are removed. The body of sin is removed. Okay. So we, we also know that you know, in the in the Old Testament, when, when people when the high priest goes into the the, the most holy place. There would be a rope tied because if they, to his leg, because if they, if he does anything wrong or if anything any fault is found in him, because he's in the presence of this holy God, he would be struck dead. Right, and the others, not wanting to die, like not wanting to enter into the holy place, they would just pull the rope and drag the body out. Such a holy God, such an awesome God. Now he turns around, and because of the shed blood of Christ, he has given us access to his very presence, to come draw near to him. He has reached out, and he has made something. He has made a way for us to draw near to him. So there's nothing, no barriers. Whatever was there, he has removed it. So that's what it says. Having boldness to enter the holiest. And what gives us the boldness? It's the blood of Jesus, right? by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil. You know, there was that veil that was separating the inner court and the most holy place. And even in the temple, there was this, there was this veil. right? And when Jesus died on the cross, that veil was torn from top to bottom. right? What does it signify? That the way has been made. Right? For us as worshippers, for us as the royal priesthood to really have access to the very presence of God. There's nothing that is separating us. Right? So he's saying, having boldness. Verse 22, it says, let us draw near. No, you draw near with boldness because of the blood of Jesus. It's not because of your performance. It's not because of your whatever you know report card of okay how spiritual you have been or how spiritual you know uh, how righteous you have been. No, it's not because of that. It's because of the shed blood of Christ. Right. So it says, verse twenty-two: Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, sprinkled, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with your water. So this is what he has done for us. This is what he has done, already done for us. So let us draw near. Okay? Let our hearts not be corrupt, but it, it, it is, let it be true uh, in full assurance of faith, drawing near, not with unbelief, but with full assurance of faith. So which means that when we draw near as worshippers, when we draw near as a royal priesthood, this revelation should really be ingrained in us. Right? This revelation that this is what Jesus did. And this tabernacle actually gives us a picture of that. You know, they had to journey through. They were not allowed inside. Only the high priest could go inside to the inner courts and the holy, most holy place. And, and he, the high priest could go into the most holy place only once a year because of the holiness of God and you know, awesomeness of God and so on. But we, as the royal priesthood, it is a great privilege for us to draw near to God, to enter into the 
this awesome holy presence of God. And we can do that with boldness. Right? Boldness doesn't mean arrogance, but with humility. With humility and boldness because of what Jesus did on the cross. Right? Okay. Third thing that we see is that, you know, the, the verse that we saw just now, verse 22. We as believers, we are washed, we are redeemed, we are made righteous by the blood of Jesus. I know you've studied this in In Christ, who we are in Christ, but we are washed, we are made righteous, and uh, we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Now, we are washed, we are redeemed, we are made righteous for various things in life, right? But most importantly, in our access to God, right? in our relation to God, you know, you know, this whole truth changes the way we relate to people, changes the way we relate to the powers of darkness and so on, right? The way we look at ourselves. And most importantly, the way we look at God, the way we relate to Him, just completely changes us, right? It says, we are washed, we are redeemed, we are made righteous to have access to enter the Holy of Holies anytime we want to. You know, it's just our intent. We can draw near. That's the most, you know, the most precious thing. It's not like that God says, okay, now you cannot come. Or, you know, now, now is the time. Now is, you know, there's no entry, no access. No, we have access. The Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle, it means the, the place where the priest would interact with God. But in our time, you know, in our time, it just means the, the presence of God, the very throne room of God. Um, access to the access to God Himself, to talk to Him, to be with Him, to to worship Him. Yeah. So so um, so that is what we see in um, I think in Colossians one, also that we have been purchased. By the blood of Jesus, and we are already translated into the kingdom of God. So that's something that is a that has already happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the thing is, um, yeah, if someone does has not already made the choice yeah you can yeah you can yeah definitely you can say okay this is what it is christ has done this so that you can have access you can enter into the kingdom of god but you and i having made that choice having made that decision are already in the kingdom of god so what does holy of holies mean to us now it's actually the very presence of god okay. so in our hearts in our minds sometimes we keep him at a distance we don't have boldness because we have messed up Maybe we don't have, or we think, oh God, you know, I need to do these 101 things and then I will be accepted in your presence, right? We think like that. But then the Bible says something else altogether. It says that, hey, you've already been washed and it had nothing to do with you or what you did. You just received by faith. You believed. You, by faith, you received what was already done. And therefore, now you can have boldness to come to the presence of God. Right? So, so that is that is how that is how we should see ourselves, right? When it comes to accessing the Holy of Holies, it means that okay, I have boldness to access God. I have boldness to go before Him. I have boldness to talk to Him. Nothing in my heart and mind should hinder me. You know, no thought, nothing at all about myself or about should hinder me from. Actually, you know, going before him, right? Okay. So, if you look at verse twenty-two, right, it encourages the believer. How does it? How does it encourage the believer to draw intentionally to God? You know, with a true heart, in sincerity, wholeheartedly. Okay, that's the first thing that we see, right? If you read that verse, uh, let us draw near with a true heart. Okay. In full assurance of faith, that's the second thing. In so what does it mean? That means faith in what Jesus has done, faith in what He has already done. So, in uh, with a true heart, meaning, you know, in all sincerity, 
and secondly, in faith. So when we draw near, let's draw near with wholeheartedly, right? not hesitatingly because of unbelief, fear, whatever, like, but we can draw near wholeheartedly. Everything within us, we can draw near. So that is how we are asked to draw near. Let us draw near. It's an invitation. Let us draw near in faith uh, with a true heart, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our body, bodies washed with pure water. Okay, That water in Ephesians talks about washing off the water with the word of God. So the, the word of God cleanses, the word of God purifies us, right? So having our bodies washed with pure water and our conscience sprinkled, evil conscience is sprinkled by the blood of Jesus, meaning cleansed. Right? So we have boldness to enter into his presence. So when we draw near, we draw near with this, with this in mind. Okay. Uh, many times we draw near full of guilt and condemnation. Right? Full of guilt, full of condemnation all the time. We're drawing near because we are awareness, we are aware of the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, which is good. We should be aware of the holiness of God. Like Isaiah, you know, Isaiah chapter in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah has this encounter and he says, you know, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. Yeah, we need to be aware of the righteousness of our, our God and the holiness of God. But we also need to be aware of what Jesus did for us and how we have been changed because of his precious blood when we draw near to God. Right? So, so many times we draw near with so much of weight of oppression and guilt and shame and condemnation. Whereas how does the Bible ask us to come? Let us draw near with boldness, having boldness to enter the Holy of Holies. Right? That should not make us arrogant, but with all humility, saying, God, you did it for me. Right? You know, you did it. I messed up, but Lord, because of your shed blood, I am cleansed. Right? And it says, having your evil conscience sprinkled and having your bodies washed with pure water, by the water of the word. So the water of the word cleanses us, changes us, and we draw near with that boldness. Okay, so, so this is how we are asked to draw near to God in order to worship. This is how we are asked to draw near to God in order to even offer these uh, of the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Right. Um, secondly, some practical things. Now, how do I express my thanksgiving? How do I express my praise to God? You know, maybe I'm just doing this personally, uh, per, you know, individually, privately in my, at my home. You know, I open up my mouth and give thanks to God. Right? Not just in my heart, but I open up my mouth and give thanks to God. Say thanks to God. Express praise to God right, with our mouths. And also with songs. Right? We can sing a song to God. Our heart can you know, uh, sing of, his, of thanksgiving, a sing of praise to Him. Right? We can do that. We can also worship God with the Word. As we draw near, we're talking about personal worship, right? As we draw near to him, we can, we can worship him with the word of God. How would, how would you worship him with the word? Anyone? Any thoughts? How would you worship him with the word? Sorry? Praising God? Yeah, so wherever we encounter you know, the character and the nature of God, it could be the character and nature of God. It, is, it could be something that he has done in the past, which captures our heart. Or it could be some promise that he is you know, he's saying, OK, this is who I am to you. I will do this for you on your behalf. Whenever we encounter that, we take it and go before God and we offer it as thanksgiving. We acknowledge and we offer praise and thanksgiving to God. And it can be a very enriching time, right? Whenever we when we, whenever we read, let's say you read something that you've read so many, you know, so many times, something like uh, a passage like Psalm 23, right? We've read it many times, right? And we've been asked to memorize, you know, if you, as a child, if you grew up in church and Sunday school, we've been asked to memorize it, so you know it. But we can use it in order to worship the Lord. How? First verse, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want 
or in other words says the lord is my shepherd he leads me guides me and so i will not be in lack lack i will not lack any good thing right so what do we do with that we can make it our thanksgiving right we can go before him with that verse with, and as we read it we can say we can come before him and say lord you are my shepherd god i thank you and just think about all that the shepherd does the shepherd leads the shepherd guides the shepherd protects the shepherd provides right saying lord you are the one who leads me you are the one who guides me you are the one who protects me you are the one oh god who provides god and so i give thanks to you what are we using we are using scripture right scripture which is declaring the infallible you know truth of god about him and so we are just using that to thank him and to worship him right and to praise him and say god i praise you because you are my shepherd you know so it is praising god with understanding right it is not just repeating praise the lord praise the lord praise the lord hallelujah but we are praising him with thanksgiving like when we worship him or when we are drawn near to him with the word of god If you look at the next verse it says he makes me to lie down in green pastures he leads me beside the still waters now green pastures again about nurturing and refreshing by the still waters he quenches my thirst and there's rest and refreshing for my soul right so maybe just feeling very uh, tired and and being harried and hassled with a lot of burdens now we just encounter this verse and say lord you make me to lie down god you are the one who does does this you give me the refreshing you nurture me so i thank you i bless your name i praise you god if we can go on and on and on like this right we can just read scripture and then just use it in our praise and worship to god so as we draw near to god in personal worship we use the scripture maybe we, we might have just read one verse but we use that in order to praise him in order to worship him right and we also uh, you know another way of praising him and worshiping him and giving thanks to him is when we pray in tongues we draw near to him we know that just repeating it we just draw near to him and we pray in tongues we pray in the spirit right is tongues a way of praising god yes how do we say that because when we pray in tongues we don't understand it the bible also says and when 1 Corinthians 14 says when we pray in tongues we we speak to god for no man understands us but how can we say conclusively that when we pray in tongues that we are actually it's one way of praising god yeah it's directly talking to him but it need, need not be praising him right talking the mysteries of god okay So how can we say that? Yeah, when I'm praying in tongues, maybe when I'm singing in tongues, like Paul says, you know, I, oh, I, I just move the notes a bit. Um, sorry. So when we, um, yeah, when we sing in tongues, hmm? How can we say conclusively that when we pray in tongues, we are actually praising God? I'm not saying all the time, but tongues is one way of praising God. Okay, let's look at the first instance when people actually prayed in tongues. Okay, Acts chapter two, right? We okay, Acts chapter two. Verse four. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay, so the first instance we read that. Then look at the response of the people who heard them. Okay, verse seven onwards. They were all amazed. They're all Galileans, etc. And what did they say? Verse eleven. Cretans and Arabs. Okay, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. right so they're talking about the wonderful works of god which is praise right so they're talking about the wonderful works of god and they are speaking in tongues another place where we see uh is chapter 10 acts chapter 10 verse 
Okay, this is in Cornelius' house, Acts chapter 10, verse 46. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And then Peter answered. So, so in, in both these cases, we see that, oh, yeah, they were praying in tongues. Paul says, you know, I, he says, you know, I, I pray with the understanding, I pray with the spirit, I sing with the understanding, I also sing with the spirit. So singing in tongues, praying in tongues is another way of magnifying God, you know, declaring the wonderful works of God. Okay. So when we draw near to God in worship, in personal worship, we can do this. And magnify God. Yeah. 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 So, so that is like same thing that we see in Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two also. They um, okay. The question is okay. They heard them speak in like Acts ten forty six. They heard them speak in tongues and magnify God. So, how do we know that they magnify God if we do not know what the tongues are? So. Uh, um, so the, the the thing is, the inference is that when, in, when we read in Acts chapter two and we read, I think verse seven and eight, we see that they declared in their own language. The, so here we see that okay, they were praying in tongues, and maybe there were some people who were speaking in the language of the people as well and magnifying God. So that is the inference, right? But we know for when we like put these scriptures together, we know for sure that. Praying in tongues is one way of praising Him, one way of magnifying God, right? Yes, it includes all the other things like we heard, I can say, you know, we're talking the mysteries of God, uh, we're talking, we are being edified in the inner man, all that happens, but also it is to thank God, to praise God, right? So, so we can actually set our minds, we can say, Lord, I, I just want to praise you, uh, right? This, I just want to take this time to thank you, to praise you, and then just begin to pray in, pray in the spirit, begin to sing in the spirit, right? Okay. And um, yeah, the fifth one that we see is that we are one of the sacrifices that we saw already that we offer the sacrifice of praise to God when we draw near to Him, right? We are called to offer. We draw near with boldness, we draw near, you know, with. The fact that we have been washed and redeemed, and so we draw near to Him, we have access to His presence, and we offer our sacrifice of praise to God. Okay, uh, Hebrews 13, 15 is the word uh, that we saw earlier. Therefore, by Him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. Psalm 100 and verse 4, enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Okay. So we when we do this, you know, we do this in our personal time as well. You know, we draw near to him and we do this in our personal time, in the privacy of our, you know, of our room or just by ourselves, we can do this. Right. So so why don't we spend some time doing that? Okay, maybe we have um, yeah, all those who are. Yes, uh, yes, Juliana. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, the questions you couldn't hear, but hopefully um, I repeated the question and the response. Um, if there's any doubt about the previous one, you can always ask, right? <coughs> okay. So uh, right now, uh, let's let's just take some time. Okay. So just like how people moved or made that journey in the tabernacle. You know, let's take some time to just be in the presence of God and personally just enter or you know, take that place or make that pathway that is already, or take that pathway which is already prepared for us, is already made a way for us to draw near. Right? So we do that with boldness. Right? As we approach God, we do that with boldness. If there's any sense of guilt or condemnation, you know, maybe if there's things that we need to repent of, we can do that. <clears throat> but we do that knowing, in faith, knowing fully well that His blood cleanses us. And He is faithful to those who ask. He's faithful to forgive. He's faithful to forgive and cleanse of all 
unrighteousness. Okay, why don't we just bow our heads <clears throat> and spend some time there? Right? Be aware that you know He has made a way. So today, you know, we do that with humility as we draw near to God in our hearts and our minds. When we draw near to God, we do it with humility, but we also do it with boldness, with confidence in the blood of Jesus. Confidence in the blood of Jesus. That's His blood cleanses, washes us right, from all unrighteousness. Right. So today, if you are you know, if you have that weight of oppression on your mind, on your heart, about something that you might have said or done, you know, get under that cleansing flood, right? And just say, God, I thank you for your. There's nothing more powerful than your blood. So, I receive that. I receive that cleansing. I receive that uh, washing. Wash me with the water of your word. So don't imagine yourself praising God or worshipping God from a distance. You're right there next to Him in the throne room. You're right there next to Him. It's not being far away. For He has made us worthy to be there. Come to the Holy of Holies. So Hebrews 4 talks about that. That we have access to come to the throne of God. To receive grace and mercy. So he has made that way for us. So let that be in our minds. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. Just thank him for the cleansing. Thank him for the position that we have. Thank him for the access that you and I have into the very presence of God. That you know the Old Testament saints did not have that. You know, they could only look forward to the cross, but we having the finished work of the cross, you know, walking in the power and the revelation of the finished work of Jesus on the cross, we have access to God, even right now. Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Master. Thank you, Lord. And so we can offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. You know, what are some things that you want to thank God for? Just go ahead and thank him. We can thank him for cleansing. We can thank him for you know this justification. We can thank him for uh, for all that he has done. Um, we can just thank him and praise him for who he is to you and what he has done. Let's take some time to do that. You personally, just with God, and say, Lord, I thank you. I bless your name and give the reason for thanking as well. I thank you because you did this. I thank you because you said this. I thank you because you opened my eyes to reveal this to me, Lord. So I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Master. Thank you, Jesus. And we can also thank him with the word. So maybe we can open up to Psalm 23 right now. Right. Open up to Psalm 23 or, 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 any, or any Psalm, but um, you know, we can turn to Psalm 23 and you know, as you quietly read through it in your mind, you know, just thank the Lord. Right. Just thank the Lord for every verse that is there, for every declaration, for every testimony that is there by the psalmist. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, which means the Lord is my shepherd as well. And so you thank the Lord for the leading, for the providing, for the protecting, for the guiding. And you just use the word, just read the word back, sing the word back, and say, the Lord, you are my shepherd. You paraphrase it, right? You declare it and say, the Lord is my shepherd. And so you make it personal and say, yes, the Lord is my shepherd. You can even talk to God and say, Lord, you are my shepherd. You are my shepherd. Yes, Lord, because you are my shepherd, I do not lack anything. I will not lack anything. I just want to declare it. 
Hallelujah. Praise you, Father God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You lead us. You make us to lie down in green pastures and by the still waters, God. We thank you, Lord, because you restore our soul, O oh, Father God. Lord, imagination, thoughts, O oh, God, which are battered and wounded, Father God. Lord, you restore it, Master. You restore it, O oh, Father God. Every uh, uh, lack of clarity, Father God, you bring focus and sharpness to our thinking, O oh, God. You restore our soul, O oh, Father God. Things that we struggle with, oppressive thoughts that we struggle with, O oh, God, Lord, I can need not be there because you restore our soul, O oh Father God. Yes, Lord, even though we walk through the valley of shadow of death, we will not fear any evil, O oh God, because you are there and you provide a table, you make a table for us, O oh God. Yes, Lord, you said you will never leave, that you will never forsake, O oh God. So I thank you, Lord, you are with us, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me, they comfort me, O oh Father God. Yes, Lord, you prepare a table, you, O oh God, put on display, O oh Father God, Lord, and right in front of my enemies, O oh Father God, and you anoint my head with oil. Let's just thank him for that. Thank the Lord. Lord, you anoint me with your oil, God. You fill me with your spirit, O oh God. You anoint me with the freshness, O oh God, of your spirit. We thank you. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. And yes, Lord, I make that declaration, God, that surely goodness and mercy will follow me. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me because I'm following you, the shepherd. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me, God, all the days of my life. And yes, Lord, we choose to dwell in the house of the Lord, both now and forever. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name. We praise you, praise you, praise you, praise you, God. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. And also, you know, you can choose to pray in the spirit, pray in tongues, and just magnify his name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father God. We thank you. We bless your name. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, so this is you know, one way by which, one way by which we can personally just draw near to God and personally worship Him. And our, and our personal time of worship can be meaningful, like it can be enriching, it can be meaningful, right? Okay, we'll take a break now. So now it's 9.55, so we'll, 10 minutes, come back at 10.05.